Shabbat Shalom. I want to remind you that this is the day that the Lord has made, and we on this Shabbat should be glad and rejoice in Him. We don't rejoice in the circumstances. There are terrible things happening in the world around us, but we rejoice in our relationship with Hashem, the one and only God, sovereign of the universe. And today we are looking at Shabbat Vayikra, the parasha. Vayikra uh, is the beginning of the third book of the Torah, which is called Sefer Varika called in English Leviticus, Vayikra uh, literally means, and he called. The Vav at the beginning is often um, an indication that it's an and. So it's a, it's a continuation. Uh, we, we tend to think of these as separate books, but in fact, of course, they initially were one Torah, and um, we have we have seen them um, separated in this way because of the content. And he called. Our opening verse, and he called Adonai to Moshe, and he spoke to him from the Mishkan, no longer from Sinai, but now. The Mishkan has been built, and God's presence indwells it. The topics in this book are what many today would call obsolete, antiquated, and even arcane. They may seem enigmatic and mysterious to modern and postmodern sensibilities. The thought of talking about sacrificing animals to some people is, uh, well, it, it's appalling and revolting. And of course, many of those people are now in the position of saying that we shouldn't be eating meat, although God said he gave it to us, um, the clean animals he gave to us as meat. Anyhow, the most contemporary Jews struggle with this book, although at one time, Vayikra was the first book the children studied in Cheder. And liberal Jews of the not-too-distant past even excluded it from their calendar of Torah readings. But what may easily be missed within the narrative of this book is the call not only to holiness, but to the true wisdom that comes only from Hashem. Hashem is the author of truth, not truth with a small T, but truth with a capital T, ultimate truth, not the kind of truth that people talk about today where, you know, it's true today and not tomorrow. Throughout the scriptures, we are warned advised and encouraged concerning the value of wisdom. In Mishlei 3.13, we read, Ashrei Adam Ma'a Chachma. Blessed is the person who finds wisdom. And wisdom is seen as, a, as an attribute, as a, as a, um, a characteristic of Hashem. The writer goes on to say, true wisdom is more profitable than wealth and nothing can compare with wisdom in ultimate value. Long life is in her right hand. Wisdom is always feminine. Riches and honor in her left. Her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who grasp her. 
whoever holds fast to her will be blessed. As is typical of the scriptures, we find this perspective stated in another way by Rav Shaul in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. He says, don't be ignorant. Ignorance. Ignorance is a lack of knowledge or awareness in general, meaning uneducated, uninformed. For example, uh, David Zev uh, Jelenotswitz, a speaker for the Zionist Organization of America, reported, I was speaking on a university campus, a university campus, and during the question time that followed my remarks, a student asked, how can it be that Judaism is older than Islam if the state of Israel wasn't established until 1948? The scriptures warn us against ignorance and encourage us to be wise. So today, I would like to concentrate on some spiritual facts of which you might be unaware or which you might have forgotten. We're always called uh, upon in scripture to remind ourselves, to remember. Any area of knowledge that is not constantly reviewed becomes like books on a shelf. They gather dust and they have little use. Think about that for a moment. I can tell you that I have um, I have studied at college, university level, all the way to a PhD, along the way studying history, social science, psychology, um, literature, a lot of different things. And I can tell you right now that I do not remember everything that I learned because many of those subjects are not things that I think about on a regular basis or pursue. So what we remember is what we spend time with. God had Israel erect monuments and write narratives and tell stories and sing songs about all the events that took place in our relationship with him. Why did he do that? Because we forget so easily. The problem is not always memory, of course. Sometimes we are ignorant because we choose not to learn from what we know or from what we have experienced. The word ignorant occurs 13 times in the scriptures. And each time it is connected with important spiritual information we should all know. This Shabbat, we're looking at the warning in scripture against idols. Now, back some years ago, one of the most popular TV shows in the UK um, has been UK Idol, which has been won by more than 200 artists. Millions of Brits tuned in to see these wannabe stars sing and dance their way to, hopefully, fame and fortune. Each week, popular votes were counted as some were eliminated from the competition and others went on to compete again. The winners became celebrities. Celebrities. Held up as popular role models, especially for aspiring performers. The show was cloned in at least 10 other countries, each of which had their own idol. But what does this word idol actually mean? Is it just a word used 
flippantly on a TV show? Or does it carry with it spiritual connotation? The fact is that the word idol is loaded with meaning from a spiritual perspective, and the popular use of it is also worth some consideration. In the scriptures, idols are forbidden by the first commandment, which warns that we are to have no gods before our God. That is, to take the place of God, or to come between us and God. Additionally, the construction of any images, or even the mention of the names of other gods, is forbidden. God's intentions are clearly stated, not only here, but throughout the scriptures. Israel, the people that God created by and for um, the one true God should not bind themselves to another God or to any world view other than that of our God. Our calling as the people of God is to worship and serve the one true God and him alone. God's choice separates us from the goyim, from ungodliness, and marks us as Hashem's special possession. The covenant he made with us provides legal parameters for this unique relationship and the limitation of exclusive worship is a significant part of the covenant that we have with him. God created and chose us, and we are to worship and serve him exclusively. Our Haftorah reading includes this part of Yeshiyahu chapter 44. Thus says Adonai, Israel's king and redeemer, Adonai Savaot, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God who is like me. Let him speak out. Let him show me clearly what has been happening since I set up the eternal people. Let him foretell future signs and events. Don't be frightened. Don't be afraid. Didn't I tell you this long ago? I foretold it, and you are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? There is no other rock. I know of none. All idol makers amount to nothing. Their precious productions profit no one, and their witnesses to their own shame neither see nor understand. Who would fashion a god or cast an image that profits no one anything? All involved will be ashamed, but more than anyone else, the people who made them. Let them all be assembled. Let them stand up. Let them fear and be shamed together. We know a day will come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Hashem and He alone is God, sovereign of the universe. And this is just another reminder that our God is the only God. But we obviously have required many and constant reminders. Although we should have long since understood all that he's saying, he must remind us again and again because we're always forgetting. God wants us to recognize that 
Idols are worthless, and so are the lives of people who chase after them. Verses 6, 7, and 8 of what I just read proclaim absolutely that our God alone is worthy to be worshipped and should be the only object of our worship. He is worthy of our worship because he is sovereign, creator, and redeemer. Who else can make that claim? Who else can claim to have provided a sacrificial atonement sufficient to redeem us and reconcile us to him? So why do we chase after idols? God alone is worthy of our worship, our praise, our thanksgiving, because he's the creator of all things, the one eternal God. Who else is like him? Mikamoka, Be'ilim Adonai, who is like you. He is the one who created the world that was that is, and all that will be. He is sovereign over the past, the present, and the future. He is worthy of our worship because he is the rock. Who else is always faithful? Who else provides all our needs? Who else strengthens us? in times of deepest despair. Our God provides strength to all who believe and who call on his name in truth. <clears throat> Pardon me. Why would anyone want another in his place? Yet people do. Human beings chase after everything under the sun in an effort to find love, to make themselves happy, all the while ignoring God. Idols are everywhere in our world. Idols are everywhere in the UK. Idols are everywhere. Are there idols in your life? Perhaps people today, especially those who see themselves as sophisticated, modern, no longer worship and bow down before statues made of wood or metal, although plenty of people around the world still do. But there are many other modern idols around. <clears throat> modern idols, yes. There may be such idols in your house or in your life. You probably don't have a carved image of Baal on your mantle or an Asherah pole in your garden. But do you have things or people in your life that you hold dearer than God? Is there someone you listen to and obey rather than God? Is there something or someone orchestrating your worldview and turning it away from God's design and plan. These are your idols. These are the things or people that draw us away and can drive us away from Hashem. To help us remember these modern idols, think of each letter in the word idol as standing for a different area of idol worship in our world and maybe in your life. The I is for individualism. I do what I want. That's the first idol, the idol of individualism. I do what I want, when I want, and how I want. I'm an individual and I choose. In such a case, you are the idol that you worship. Right and wrong become gray areas. There are no standards. Right and wrong are up to the individual. 
depending on the situation. My own ideas, thoughts, and judgments are more important than God's. I follow my own plans and ideas rather than those of God. The consequences of individualism are serious. As we see society willing to accept, well, homosexuality, transsexuality, and such lifestyles as the norm, people calling an individual them or they. Sex before and outside of marriage is the norm. Rape, murder, assault, these have become commonplace and no one cares about anyone but himself or herself. The second letter is D for deeds. I'm a good person. The idol of good deeds. The idea that mitzvot gets you a place in the world to come persists. In fact, most people who believe in the possibility of life after death believe that all good people, by whose definition we're not sure, um, will get into heaven. But the question I have is, why spend eternity with God when you don't want to spend a few hours a week with him? Most people genuinely believe that if a person is good or does enough good things that kind of outweigh the bad ones, um, during his or her lifetime, he or she will earn a place in heaven or whatever the afterlife is of a positive nature. These people honestly see no particular connection between going to heaven and a genuine relationship with God. If told what God has to say on the subject, most people feel that this is wrong. How dare God have rules and regulations for the Alam Haba, the world to come? These must be sectarian thoughts, not God's. How do such ideas impact our society? Well, most people believe God is superfluous to requirement. His commandments are outdated. They're not needed or wanted. His redemption by the blood of Mashiach Yeshua is absurd. Most people today, especially in the UK, live their lives without God. Third letter is O for opulence. Another word for wealth, luxury, money. The song goes, money makes the world go round. Most people's lives are run by money and the desire for money and what money will provide. God is forgotten in the rat race for worldly success. How many people consult God as to what job to take, even if it impinges on Shabbat? Or is it at all, it's about getting ahead? Is tithing high on the list of what we do with our money? Does any extra cash that we might come by go to help those in need, investing for eternity, or or do we spend extra money on ourselves in the belief that we deserve it? How does money impact our society? It's certainly an idol, and people will do anything for money. Paying bills and making money, advancement in the workplace, do these take up more time in your life than the time you invest with God? L is for leisure. This is the fourth idol, the idol of leisure, largely unknown in the past. This includes hobbies, TV, movies, music, vacations, shopping, and the thousands of other items and activities 
that give us pleasure and which we use to make ourselves happy, a word which itself comes from the idea that chance rather than God makes our lives good. Materialism is central to life here in the UK, and it's focused on entertainment and pleasure, two areas of life almost unknown a hundred years ago. It's remarkable the impact movies and TV, music and the arts have on our beliefs about God, life, death, sex, family and marriage. Many people buy a particular product or service because they hope it will bring them pleasure even if it's not good for them and is not something God would sanction. How does this impact our society? Well, TV, movies, gaming, music, as well as other leisure activities are an influential part of every person's life today. Such things impact our beliefs and encourage us to allow the world's ideas to contaminate what we know God wants in our lives. The groups most affected are young people and children, those whose ideas are not yet firmly fixed. In the words of a popular TV jingle for holidays, nobody makes me happy, makes me feel good, makes me feel this way, Nobody but me. If you think Torah or the ideas of the prophets are outdated and of little concern in the modern world, think again. The values of the world are increasingly prevalent within the fabric of our society to the exclusion of the principles and the teachings of God. We do not face a pantheon of false gods like our people in the past, but we do face something much more insidious. We face an assault from a pantheon of false ideas and values, materialism, ambition, love of entertainment, sensuality, worship of self, and many others. God's first and second commandments, according to Rav Yeshua, the core of all the commandments, have been abandoned by most of those around us, including many in the Jewish community and those who even say they follow Mashiach Yeshua. We must ask ourselves, how are we being influenced? Who or what is the object of our affections? What takes the majority of our time? What is the focus of our efforts and of our attention? On what do we spend the greatest amount of our resources? Money, time, energy, gifting. Let's look again at what God has to say about idolatry and ignorance. Yeshiyahu brilliantly portrays the foolishness of idols and those who make them. Foolishness is ignorance in action. A simple look at how idols are made shows how silly it is to regard them as gods. So the idol makers are witnesses against themselves. Those who create these idols are human beings. They're weak and frail, ultimately inconsequential in the great scheme of things. The craftsman may work hard to carve the idol, but it's only wood. One half is the object of worship. The other half is burned in the fire for warmth or cooking. Creation rejoices when God redeems and glorifies himself in his people. As Rav Shaul declares in Romans 8, 
19 through 22. God demonstrates that he is the one and only true God by telling us that he is our redeemer and foretelling our redemption. Thus says the Lord your redeemer and he who formed you from the womb. I am the one. I am the one who formed you, who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Yerushalayim, you shall be inhabited. To the cities of Yehuda, you shall be built. I will raise up your waste places. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the Mikdash, your foundation shall be laid. We are told that the ignorant shut their eyes so that they cannot see. But how could they fail to see what is so obvious about the stupidity of idolatry in the face of the power of God? Is God condemning man for something for which he is responsible? No, almost from the beginning, human beings have chosen darkness and thus blindness. In the end, God gave us up to the desires of our hearts. In the same way, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, although we also know that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. God did not harden Pharaoh's heart against his will. He simply gave Pharaoh up to his own desires. In the same way, the one who worships an idol of whatever kind chooses a delusion and becomes deluded. The wooden idol is just a fire away from being ashes. Honoring and worshiping an idol is as wise and as satisfying as eating ashes. This is the point. Only God can bring satisfaction to our souls, to our hearts, and to our spirits. One who worships an idol of any kind is in bondage to it. Those who willfully shut their eyes and harden their hearts will find in the end that God will give them up to the lies they choose to believe. We are warned and instructed to remember and honor the greatness and the glory of the one true God. Remember these words, O Yaakov and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Yaakov and glorified himself in Israel. When we consider the alternative to following God, we should be more convinced than ever to say close to him. As Shimon Kepha said to Yeshua, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. If the foolish foolishness of the alternative isn't enough to convince you, 
God gives us more reasons to trust and love him. I have formed you. You are my servant. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions. I have redeemed you. And what do our idols accomplish for us? Oh yes, nothing. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. This is the only logical reaction we can have when we understand who God is. But these verses acknowledge that if we don't praise him, creation will do so. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break into singing, you mountains. Creation rejoices. And look at the claims God makes through the whole of this Haftorah portion. He's the creator of the people of Israel, the creator of all things. His wisdom is beyond our understanding, frustrating the designs of the babblers. There are an awful lot of babblers around today. He upholds his own and he resurrects the dead, even dead cities. We've seen that happen in the land of Israel as not only Jerusalem, who, which is mentioned, but also cities like Ashdod and Ashkelon and, and many more. Tekoa, the city of Amos, also has been revived. Amazing things are happening. We see that revival. God pro proves his claims by even announcing the name of the one who will deliver us from our exile in Babylon, Persia, more than 200 years before Cyrus came to the throne. This special dimension of prediction is at home with Yeshiahu, who more than any other of our prophets made predictions and fulfillment the keystone of his proof that Hashem is the only God. In fact, Josephus, the historian in his Antiquities, relates that when Cyrus came across his name mentioned in this place in Yeshiahu 22, years before he lived, years before he lived, he was seized by a holy desire to fulfill what was written of him 220 years earlier. God is our shepherd, using Cyrus to return us to the true fold in Yehuda. This oracle is the first explicit reference to God's plans to rebuild Jerusalem. We know from the prophet Yermiahu that we would be in exile for 70 years, but here we see what God has in store for us. Cyrus' royal proclamations fulfilling this prophecy are found in Ezra 1 and 2, 1 verse 2, and Debre Ha Amim Bet 36, 23. With such an amazing specific claim, God proves that He alone is the God who can predict and fulfill prophecy. Idolatry, in sharp contrast, is a fool's game. Whether your idol is a football star, an actor, a singer, or some other famous person, such an idol is no better than a piece of wood. If your idol is money, success, pleasure, having a good time, doing what pleases you, these will one day be as worthless as the ashes of a fire. God gives us every reason to look to him alone, to trust him, to have faith in him, to honor and worship him, and to be obedient to his commandments so that our lives 
will have true value, meaning, and purpose. May you be blessed through the week ahead, and I want to remind you to continue to pray about what's going on in the Ukraine for strength and for peace. God bless and keep you.